Welcome to the Friday edition of Wands World and um, welcome to the first week of Lent. Uh, we're unpacking Easter for the next few weeks until um, I think maybe Pentecost, not sure. Um, but on Tuesday I omitted an important uh, piece of information about Carnival. That is, Tuesday was Shrove Tuesday. Well, the problem is that I made the video on Monday. Monday is traditionally in England known as Collop Monday. It's the day when you supposedly eat collops of meat, that is, um, thin slices of meat and eggs usually. And some people believe that it's the um, founding festival of bacon and eggs uh, or ham and eggs and particularly bacon and eggs for breakfast. Don't know about that um, but Monday was Collop Monday, Tuesday was Shrove Tuesday and the day I'm making this video Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. So I want to talk about those three all together leading into a more general discussion of Lent. I don't normally do much in the way of special things for Collop Monday because it never was an important part of my growing up, but Pancake Day was. I could never figure out <laughs> why my mother at some stage in usually February um, got the frying pan out and started making pancakes as our um, dinner dessert <laughs> on one Tuesday because uh, I just couldn't keep track of it because I was raised Presbyterian. Presbyterians don't celebrate Lent so it just never dawned on me but my mother was raised Church of England and they do celebrate Shrove Tuesday, Ash Wednesday um, and Lent, the period of Lent. So she knew all about it and she did it and I do the same. So here's my pancakes for Pancake Tuesday. Um, <laughs> they were fine. Uh, the basic recipe is um, you mix up some flour and water and then add eggs and then let it sit for about 20-30 minutes and then make what the English call pancakes, which are um, what the French would more likely call crip. Um, in Spanish they're called panqueques and they're, they're very popular in Argentina all year round. Um, in England they're mostly associated with Shrove Tuesday and if you look up pancakes in Mrs. Beaton, she says, you know, do this, you know, do this, this and so forth. Serve with lemon and sugar. Um, which I always do, it's lovely, and serve only on Shrove Tuesday, don't have it any other time of the year. You can make pancakes any day of the year and I do sometimes have dulce leche pancakes or, um, or a curry chicken or whatever, but pancakes with lemon and sugar, pancake day only. And then in the Anglican and Catholic tradition then you're supposed to put away pleasures for the period of Lent. And that historically used to include meat. Um, although now I think the Catholic Church just requires 
uh, abstinence from meat on Fridays in Lent only. I'm not sure about that. Something I just never bothered much with. Never bothered much with the idea of giving something up for Lent. Um, didn't seem um, to make much sense to me. But historically, it actually does make a lot of sense. In January and February, the cold parts of the winter in the north is a time when animals, particularly sheep, um, give birth. So in February you've got these tiny little lambs hanging on, the shepherds are protecting them, keeping them safe from wolves and the cold and ice and snow and so forth. And you've been through a long winter already, no green vegetables, um, you probably had to make do with parsnips and, and potatoes and um, some salted meat and and here you've got these delightful little lambs and all you've got to do is kill one and pop it in the oven and you've got some nice meat. But if you do that, you don't have a flock. You have to abstain from eating your little ones until they grow. So the period of Lent has a real social function in the days before refrigeration, um, before mass transit of food and so forth, in the days when you basically had to eat what was grown locally. So you have to have something in place that will prevent you from doing something that will be counterproductive, that is eating your little lambs. You eat them all now. I mean, a, a newborn lamb probably wouldn't um, satisfy more than one person, um, possibly two. But a fully grown lamb um, is, is a much better um, bet and, and you don't need to, you don't need to eat all of them, you can eat like a quarter of them, let's say, and let the rest grow up and increase your flock. So one of the benefits of not eating meat in Lent is protecting your resources during a very, very difficult time. Because spring is coming, you might be able to get a few fresh greens, um, you're still going to have to eat a lot of potatoes, but maybe some lettuce, maybe some spinach, um, maybe still some bacon knocking around, um, so, and cheese maybe, um, because you've, you, you're milking the cows and, and the sh milking the sheep and so forth. So you've got enough to keep you going, but you've got to be parsimonious. Now this is the thing about Lent that most people who are not ecclesiastically inclined don't understand. Lent starts Ash Wednesday uh, and goes all the way to Good Friday, East, Easter Saturday, that is the Saturday after Good Friday, and ends on Easter Sunday. Now, if you do your counting, that's 46 days. Um, but Lent is 40 days. How does that work out? Um, like 40 days is a round number in biblical um, terms, both in the Hebrew Bible and in the Greek Bible. And it is said that Jesus fasted in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. Um, it's also said that Noah's flood uh, was created by the, the rains raining for 40 days and 40 nights. So 40 is a round number. So Lent is 40 days. So how come there's 46 days between Ash Wednesday and Easter Sunday. Very simple. Every Sunday is a feast day. All year. Even in Lent, Sunday is a feast day. So you get a break once a week. Uh, you're not supposed to go hog wild. <laughs> but if you have decided, for example, that you're not eating meat 
for the whole period of Lent, which I've done a couple of times. I've done a, a lot of you know, recreations of, of medieval fasting habits uh, when I was an, a, an active pastor. And the great joy is on Sunday you can break your fast, which remember um, gives us the word breakfast. You break your fast on every Sunday. That doesn't mean that you, you know, <laughs> you have a 16 ounce steak or something like that, but you can have a little bit of meat. You can indulge a little bit. Um, it, it makes the <laughs> the other 40 days somehow go along a little better. Now this year I've decided that I don't particularly want to have uh, a specific discipline for the, for the um, 40 days of Lent. Um, I have, uh, I have I'm in, I've already stopped smoking cigars uh, several weeks ago I had initially thought that that would be um, what I would accomplish in Lent. Uh, that I would um, I would forego cigars in, in the hope that I would not be smoking them again. But anyway, I, I stopped two weeks ago, and I haven't been I haven't been smoking them. They're not good for my blood pressure, among other things. And I take my blood pressure twice a day, and Every time I smoke a cigar, it goes up. So, so I don't need the church to tell me to stop smoking cigars. So it won't be a particularly austere Lent um, for me. Um, <laughs> I mean, with the pandemic, it's been, it, it's been Lent for the past three years almost. So, so I, you know, no travel. Um, very little photography. Um, I have been cooking well enough, as you saw in my Tuesday video. You can see all my special sauces and so forth that I, I um, indulge in. And I'm going to continue to do that during Lent. So in this Lenten period, I'm going to talk specifically about the different tones that the weeks have ecclesiastically. And I'll start on Tuesday with the, um, with the first sentiment for the first week of, um, of Lent, and we'll move from there. So if you haven't done it yet, please like and subscribe to my videos. Have a good weekend. Uh, I'm off to teach today for the first time in several months. <laughs> And I hope everything goes well for you over the weekend, and I will see you on Tuesday.